A Visit from the Goon Squad by Jennifer Egan Poets claim that we recapture for a moment the self that we were long ago when we enter some house or garden in which we used to live in our youth. But these are most hazardous pilgrimages, which end as often in disappointment as in success. It is in ourselves that we should rather seek to find those fixed places, contemporaneous with different years. The unknown element in the lives of other people is like that of nature, which each fresh scientific discovery merely reduces but does not abolish. Marcel Proust, In Search of Lost Time Chapter 1. Found Objects It began the usual way, in the bathroom of the Lassimo Hotel. Sasha was adjusting her yellow eye shadow in the mirror when she noticed a bag on the floor beside the sink that must have belonged to the woman whose peeing she could faintly hear through the vault-like door of a toilet stall. Inside the rim of the bag, barely visible, was a wallet made of pale green leather. It was easy for Sasha to recognize, looking back, that the peeing woman's blind trust had provoked her. We live in a city where people will steal the hair off your head if you give them half a chance, but you leave your stuff lying in plain sight and expect it to be waiting for you when you come back. It made her want to teach the woman a lesson, but this wish only camouflaged the deeper feeling Sasha always had. That fat, tender wallet, offering itself to her hand it seemed so dull, so life as usual to just leave it there rather than seize the moment, accept the challenge, take the leap, why the coop, throw caution to the wind, live dangerously, I get it, cuz, her therapist, said, and take the fucking thing. You mean steal it. He was trying to get Sasha to use that word, which was harder to avoid in the case of a wallet than with a lot of the things she'd lifted over the past year, when her condition, as cuz referred to it, had begun to accelerate, five sets of keys, fourteen pairs of sunglasses, a child's striped scarf, binoculars, a cheese grater, a pocket knife, 28 bars of soap, and 80, 5 pens, ranging from cheap ballpoints she'd used to sign debit card slips to the Aubergine Visconti that cost two hundred sixty dollars online, which she'd lifted from her former boss's lawyer during a contracts meeting. Sasha no longer took anything from stores there cold. Inert goods didn't tempt her. Only from people. Okay, she said. Steal it. Sasha and Cuz had dubbed that feeling she got the personal challenge, as in, taking the wallet was a way for Sasha to assert her toughness, her individuality. What they needed to do was switch things around in her head so that the challenge became not taking the wallet, but leaving it. That would be the cure, although Cuz never used words like cure. He wore funky sweaters and let her call him Cuz, but he was old school and scrutable, to the point where Sasha couldn't tell if he was gay or straight, if he'd written famous books, or if, as she sometimes suspected, he was one of those escaped cons who impersonate surgeons and wind up leaving their operating tools inside people's skulls. Of course, these questions could have been resolved on Google in less than a minute, but they were useful questions, according to Cuz, and so far, Sasha had resisted. The couch where she lay in his office was blue leather and very soft. Cuz liked the couch, he'd told her, because it relieved them both of the burden of eye contact. You don't like eye contact? Sasha had asked. It seemed like a weird thing for a therapist to admit. Find it tiring, he'd said. This way, we can both look where we'll want. Where will you look? He smiled. You can see my options. Where do you usually look? When people are on the couch. Around the room, Cuz said. At the ceiling. Into space. Do you ever sleep? No. Sasha usually looked at the window, which faced the street and tonight, as she continued her story, was rippled with rain. She'd glimpsed the wallet, tender and overripe as a peach. She'd plucked it from the woman's bag and slipped it into her own small handbag, which she'd zipped shut before the sound of peeing had stopped. She'd icked open the bathroom door and floated back through the lobby to the bar. She and the wallet's owner had never seen each other. Pre-wallet, Sasha had been in the grip of a dire evening, lame date, yet another, 
brooding behind dark bangs, sometimes glancing at the at-screen TV, where a Jets game seemed to interest him more than Sasha's admittedly overhandled tales of Benny Salazar, her old boss, who was famous for founding the Sow's Ear record label and who also, Sasha happened to know, sprinkled gold flakes into his coffee as an aphrodisiac. She suspected and sprayed pesticide in his armpits. Post-wallet, however, the scene tingled with mirthful possibility. Sasha felt the waiters eyeing her as she sidled back to the table, holding her handbag with its secret weight. She sat down and took a sip of her melon madness martini and cocked her head at Alex. She smiled her yes-slash-no smile. Hello, she said. The yes-slash-no smile was amazingly effective. You're happy, Alex said. I'm always happy, Sasha said. Sometimes I just forget. Alex had paid the bill while she was in the bathroom clear proof that he'd been on the verge of aborting their date. Now he studied her. You feel like going somewhere else? They stood. Alex wore black cords and a white button-up shirt. He was a legal secretary. On email he'd been fanciful, almost goofy, but in person he seemed simultaneously anxious and bored. She could tell that he was in excellent shape, not from going to the gym, but from being young enough that his body was still imprinted with whatever sports he'd played in high school and college. Sasha, who was 35, had passed that point. Still, not even cuz knew her real age. The closest anyone had come to guessing it was 31, and most put her in her 20s. She worked out daily and avoided the sun. Her online profiles all listed her as 28. As she followed Alex from the bar, she couldn't resist unzipping her purse and touching the fat green wallet just for a second, for the contraction it made her feel around her heart. You're aware of how the theft makes you feel, Cuz said, to the point where you remind yourself of it to improve your mood. But do you think about how it makes the other person feel? Sasha tipped back her head to look at him. She made a point of doing this now and then, just to remind Cuz that she wasn't an idiot she knew the question had a right answer. She and Cuz were collaborators, writing a story whose end had already been determined, she would get well. She would stop stealing from people and start caring again about the things that had once guided her, music. The network of friends she'd made when she first came to New York. A set of goals she'd scrawled on a big sheet of newsprint and taped to the walls of her early apartments. Find a band to manage, understand the news, study Japanese, practice the harp. I don't think about the people, Sasha said. But it isn't that you lack empathy, Cuz said. We know that, because of the plumber. Sasha sighed. She told Cuz the plumber story about a month ago and he'd found a way to bring it up at almost every session since. The plumber was an old man, sent by Sasha's landlord to investigate a leak in the apartment below hers. He'd appeared in Sasha's doorway, tufts of gray on his head, and within a minute boom he'd hit the door and crawled under her bathtub like an animal fumbling its way into a familiar hole. The fingers he'd groped toward the bolts behind the tub were grimed to cigar stubs, and reaching made his sweatshirt hike up, exposing a soft white back. Sasha turned away, stricken by the old man's abasement, anxious to leave for her temp job, except that the plumber was talking to her, asking about the length and frequency of her showers. I never use it, she told him curtly. I shower at the gym. He nodded without acknowledging her rudeness apparently used to it. Sasha's nose began to prickle. She shut her eyes and pushed hard on both temples. Opening her eyes, she saw the plumber's tool belt lying on the floor at her feet. It had a beautiful screwdriver in it, the orange translucent handle gleaming like a lollipop in its worn leather loop, the silvery shaft sculpted, sparkling. Sasha felt herself contract around the object in a single yawn of appetite. She needed to hold the screwdriver, just for a minute. She bent her knees and plucked it noiselessly from the belt. Not a bangle jangled, her bony hands were spastic at most things, but she was good at this made for it, she often thought, in the first drifty moments after lifting something. And once the screwdriver was in her hand, 
She felt instant relief from the pain of having an old soft-backed man snuffling under her tub, and then something more than relief. A blessed indifference, as if the very idea of feeling pain over such a thing were baffling. And what about after he'd gone? Cuz had asked when Sasha told him the story. How did the screwdriver look to you then? There was a pause. Normal, she said. Really? Not special anymore. Like any screwdriver. Sasha had heard Cuz shift behind her and felt something happen in the room, the screwdriver, which she'd placed on the table, recently supplemented with a second table, where she kept the things she'd lifted and which she'd barely looked at since, seemed to hang in the air of Cuz's office. It floated between them, a symbol. And how did you feel? Cuz asked quietly. About having taken it from the plumber you pitted? How did she feel? How did she feel? There was a right answer, of course. At times Sasha had to fight the urge to lie simply as a way of depriving Cuz of it. Bad, she said. Okay. I felt bad. Shit, I'm bankrupting myself, Topi, for you. Obviously, I get that this isn't a great way to live. More than once, Cuz had tried to connect the plumber to Sasha's father, who had disappeared when she was six. She was careful not to indulge this line of thinking. I don't remember him, she told Cuz. I have nothing to say. She did this for Cuz's protection, and her own they were writing a story of redemption, of fresh beginnings and second chances. But in that direction lay only sorrow. Sasha and Alex crossed the lobby of the Lassimo Hotel in the direction of the street. Sasha hugged her purse to her shoulder, the warm ball of wallet snuggled in her armpit. As they passed the angular budded branches by the big glass doors to the street, a woman zigzagged into their path. Wait, she said. You haven't seen I'm desperate. Sasha felt a twang of terror. It was the woman whose wallet she'd taken. She knew this instantly, although the person before her had nothing in common with the blithe, raven-haired wallet owner she'd pictured. This woman had vulnerable brown eyes and at pointy shoes that clicked too loudly on the marble floor. There was plenty of gray in her frizzy brown hair. Sasha took Alex's arm, trying to steer him through the doors. She felt his pulse of surprise at her touch, but he stayed put. Have we seen what? he said. Someone stole my wallet. My ID is gone, and I have to catch a plane tomorrow morning. I'm just desperate. She stared beseechingly at both of them. It was the sort of frank need that New Yorkers quickly learn how to hide, and Sasha recoiled. It had never occurred to her that the woman was from out of town. Have you called the police? Alex asked. The concierge said he would call. But I'm also wondering, could it have fallen out somewhere? She looked helplessly at the marble floor around their feet. Sasha relaxed slightly. This woman was the type who annoyed people without meaning to. Apology shadowed her movements even now, as she followed Alex to the concierge desk. Sasha trailed behind. Is someone helping this person? She heard Alex ask. The concierge was young and spiky-haired. We've called the police he said defensively. Alex turned to the woman. Where did this happen? In the lady's room. I think. Who else was there? No one. It was empty? There might have been someone, but I didn't see her. Alex swung around to Sasha. You were just in the bathroom, he said. Did you see anyone? No, she managed to say. She had Xanax in her purse, but she couldn't open her purse. Even with it zipped, she feared that the wallet would blurt into view in some way that she couldn't control, unleashing a cascade of horrors, arrest, shame, poverty, death. Alex turned to the concierge. How come I'm asking these questions instead of you? He said. Someone just got robbed in your hotel. Don't you have, like, security? The words robbed and security managed to pierce the soothing backbeat that pumped through not just the Lassimo, but every hotel like it in New York City. There was a mild ripple of interest from the lobby. I've called security, the concierge said, adjusting his neck. I'll call them again. Sasha glanced at Alex. 
He was angry, and the anger made him recognizable in a way that an hour of aimless chatter, mostly hers, it was true, had not. He was new to New York. He came from someplace smaller. He had a thing or two to prove about how people should treat one another. Two security guys showed up, the same on TV and in life. Beefy guys whose scrupulous politeness was somehow linked to their willingness to crack skulls. They dispersed to search the bar. Sasha wished feverishly that she'd left the wallet there, as if this were an impulse she'd barely resisted. I'll check the bathroom, she told Alex, and forced herself to walk slowly around the elevator bank. The bathroom was empty. Sasha opened her purse, took out the wallet, unearthed her vial of Xanax, and popped one between her teeth. They worked faster if you chewed them. As the caustic taste flooded her mouth, she scanned the room, trying to decide where to ditch the wallet in the stall. Under the sink, the decision paralyzed her. She had to do this right, to emerge unscathed, and if she could, if she did, she had a frenzied sense of making a promise to Cuz. The bathroom door opened, and the woman walked in. Her frantic eyes met Sasha's in the bathroom mirror, narrow, green, equally frantic. There was a pause during which Sasha felt that she was being confronted. The woman knew, had known all along. Sasha handed her the wallet. She saw, from the woman's stunned expression, that she was wrong. I'm sorry, Sasha said quickly. It's a problem I have. The woman opened the wallet. Her physical relief at having it back coursed through Sasha in a warm rush, as if their bodies had fused. Everything's there, I swear, she said. I didn't even open it. It's this problem I have, but I'm getting help. I just please don't tell. I'm hanging on by a thread. The woman glanced up, her soft brown eyes moving over Sasha's face. What did she see? Sasha wished that she could turn and peer in the mirror again, as if something about herself might at last be revealed some lost thing. But she didn't turn. She held still and let the woman look. It struck her that the woman was close to her own age, her real age. She probably had children at home. Okay, the woman said, looking down. It's between us. Thank you, Sasha said. Thank you, thank you. Relief and the first gentle waves of Xanax made her feel faint, and she leaned against the wall. She sensed the woman's eagerness to get away. She longed to slide to the floor. There was a rap on the door, a man's voice. Any luck? Sasha and Alex left the hotel and stepped into desolate, windy Trebekah. She'd suggested the Lassimo out of habit. It was near Sow's ear records where she'd worked for 12 years as Benny Salazar's assistant. But she hated the neighborhood at night without the World Trade Center, whose blazing freeways of light had always filled her with hope. She was tired of Alex. In a mere 20 minutes, they'd blown past the desired point of meaningful connection through shared experience into the less appealing state of knowing each other too well. Alex wore a knit cap pulled over his forehead. His eyelashes were long and black. That was weird, he said finally. Yeah, Sasha said. Then, after a pause, you mean finding it? The whole thing. But yeah, he turned to her. Was it, like, concealed from view? It was lying on the floor, in the corner, kind of behind a planter. The utterance of this lie caused pinpricks of sweat to emerge on Sasha's Xanax-soothed skull. She considered saying, actually, there was no planter, but managed not to. It's almost like she did it on purpose, Alex said. For attention or something. She didn't seem like that type. You can't tell. That's something I'm learning here in NYC. You have no fucking idea what people are really like. They're not even two-faced. They're, like, multiple personalities. She wasn't from New York. Sasha said, irked by his obliviousness even as she strove to preserve it. Remember? She was getting on a plane? True, Alex said. He paused and cocked his head, regarding Sasha across the ill-lit sidewalk. But you know what I'm talking about? That thing about people? I do know, she said carefully. 
but I think you get used to it. I'd rather just go somewhere else. It took Sasha a moment to understand. There is nowhere else, she said. Alex turned to her, startled. Then he grinned. Sasha grinned back, not the yes slash no smile, but related. That's ridiculous, Alex said. They took a cab and climbed the four flights to Sasha's lower east side walk up. She'd lived there six years. The place smelled of scented candles, and there was a velvet throw cloth on her sofa bed and lots of pillows, and an old color TV with a very good picture, and an array of souvenirs from her travels lining the windowsills, a white seashell, a pair of red dice, a small canister of tiger balm from China, now dried to the texture of rubber, a tiny bonsai tree that she watered faithfully. Look at this, Alex said. You've got a tub in the kitchen. I've heard of that, I mean I've read about it, but I wasn't sure there were any left. The shower thing is new, right? This is a bathtub in the kitchen apartment, right? Yup, Sasha said. But I almost never use it. I shower at the gym. The tub was covered with a fitted board where Sasha stacked her plates. Alex ran his hands under the rim of the bath and examined its clawed feet. Sasha lit her candles, took a bottle of grappa from the kitchen cupboard, and filled two small glasses. I love this place, Alex said. It feels like old New York. You know this stuff is around, but how do you find it? Sasha leaned against the tub beside him and took a tiny sip of grappa. It tasted like Xanax. She was trying to remember Alex's age on his prolo. 28, she thought, but he seemed younger than that, maybe a lot younger. She saw her apartment as he must see it a bit of local color that would fade almost instantly into the tumble of adventures that everyone has on first coming to New York. It jarred Sasha to think of herself as a glint in the hazy memories that Alex would struggle to organize a year or two from now. Where was that place with the bathtub? Who was that girl? He left the tub to explore the rest of the apartment. To one side of the kitchen was Sasha's bedroom. On the other side, facing the street, was her living room den office, which contained two upholstered chairs and the desk she reserved for projects outside of work publicity for bands she believed in, short reviews for Vibe and Spin, although these had fallen oh sharply in recent years. In fact, the whole apartment, which six years ago had seemed like a way station to some better place, had ended up solidifying around Sasha, gathering mass and weight, until she felt both mired in it and lucky to have it as if she not only couldn't move on but didn't want to. Alex leaned over to peer at the tiny collection on her windowsills. He paused at the picture of Rob, Sasha's friend who had drowned in college, but made no comment. He hadn't noticed the tables where she kept the pile of things she'd stolen, the pens, the binoculars, the keys, the child's scarf, which she'd lifted simply by not returning it when it dropped from a little girl's neck as her mother led her by the hand from a Starbucks. Sasha was already seeing cuz by then, so she recognized the litany of excuses even as they throbbed through her head. Winter is almost over. Children grow so fast. Kids hate scarves. It's too late, they're out the door. I'm embarrassed to return it. I could easily not have seen it fall, in fact I didn't. I'm just noticing it now, look, a scarf. A kid's bright yellow scarf with pink stripes too bad. Who could it belong to? Well, I'll just pick it up and hold it for a minute. At home, she'd wash the scarf by hand and folded it neatly. It was one of the things she liked best. What's all this? Alex asked. He discovered the tables now and was staring at the pile. It looked like the work of a miniaturist beaver, a heap of objects that was illegible, yet clearly not random. To Sasha's eye, it almost shook under its load of embarrassments and close shaves and little triumphs and moments of pure exhilaration. It contained years of her life compressed. The screwdriver was at the outer edge. Sasha moved closer to Alex drawn to the sight of him taking everything in. And how did you feel, standing with Alex in front of all those things you'd stolen? Cuz asked. Sasha turned her face into the blue couch because her cheeks were heating up and she hated that. She didn't want to explain to Cuz the mix of feelings she'd had, standing there with Alex, 
the pride she took in these objects, a tenderness that was only heightened by the shame of their acquisition. She'd risked everything, and here was the result, the raw, warped core of her life. Watching Alex move his eyes over the pile of objects stirred something in Sasha. She put her arms around him from behind, and he turned, surprised, but willing. She kissed him full on the mouth, then undid his zipper and kicked out her boots. Alex tried to lead her toward the other room, where they could lie down on the sofa bed, but Sasha dropped to her knees beside the tables and pulled him down, the Persian carpet prickling her back, street light falling through the window onto his hungry, hopeful face, his bare white thighs. Afterward, they lay on the rug for a long time. The candles started to sputter. Sasha saw the prickly shape of the bonsai silhouetted against the window near her head. All her excitement had seeped away, leaving behind a terrible sadness, an emptiness that felt violent, as if she'd been gouged. She tottered to her feet, hoping Alex would leave soon. He still had his shirt on. You know what I feel like doing, he said, standing up. To Kinga bath in that tub. You canned, Sasha said dully. It works. The plumber was just here. She pulled up her jeans and collapsed onto a chair. Alex went to the tub, carefully removed the plates from the wood cover, and lifted it off. Water gushed from the faucet. Its force had always startled Sasha, the few times she'd used it. Alex's black pants were crumpled on the floor at Sasha's feet. The square of his wallet had worn away the corduroy from one of the back pockets, as if he often wore these pants, and always with the wallet in that place. Sasha glanced over at him. Steam rose from the tub as he dipped in a hand to test the water. Then he came back to the pile of objects and leaned close, as if looking for something specific. Sasha watched him, hoping for a tremor of the excitement she'd felt before, but it was gone. Can I put some of these in? He was holding up a packet of bath salt Sasha had taken from her best friend, Lizzie, a couple of years ago before they'd stopped speaking. The salts were still in their polka dot wrapping. They'd been deep in the middle of the pile, which had collapsed a little from the extraction. How had Alex even seen them? Sasha hesitated. She and Cuz had talked at length about why she kept the stolen objects separate from the rest of her life, because using them would imply greed or self-interest, because leaving them untouched made it seem as if she might one day give them back, because piling them in a heap kept their power from leaking away. I guess, she said. I guess you can. She was aware of having made a move in the story she and Cuz were writing, taken a symbolic step, but toward the happy ending or away from it. She felt Alex's hand on the back of her head, stroking her hair. You like it hot? He asked. Or medium? Hot, she said. Really, really hot. Me too. He went back to the tub and fiddled with the knobs and shook in some of the salts, and the room instantly filled with a steamy plant-like odor that was deeply familiar to Sasha, the smell of Lizzie's bathroom, from the days when Sasha used to shower there after she and Lizzie went running together in Central Park. Where are your towels? Alex called. She kept them folded in a basket in the bathroom. Alex went to get them, then shut the bathroom door. Sasha heard him starting to pee. She knelt on the floor and slipped his wallet from his pants pocket and opened it, her heart ring with a sudden pressure. It was a plain black wallet, worn to gray along the edges. Rapidly she icked through its contents, a debit card, a work ID, a gym card. In a side pocket, a faded picture of two boys and a girl in braces, squinting on a beach. A sports team in yellow uniforms had so small she couldn't tell if one of them belonged to Alex. From among these dog-eared photos, a scrap of binder paper dropped into Sasha's lap. It looked very old, the edges torn, the pale blue lines rubbed almost away. Sasha unfolded it and saw written, in blunt pencil, I believe in you. She froze, staring at the words. They seemed to tunnel toward her from their meager scrap, bringing a ush of embarrassment for Alex, who'd kept this disintegrating tribute in his disintegrating wallet, and then shame at herself for having looked at it. 
She was faintly aware of the sink taps being turned on and of the need to move quickly. Hastily, mechanically, she reassembled the wallet, keeping the slip of paper in her hand. I'm just going to hold this, she was aware of telling herself as she tucked the wallet back into Alex's pocket. I'll put it back later. He probably doesn't remember it's in there. I'll actually be doing him a favor by getting it out of the way before someone finds it. I'll say, hey, I noticed this on the rug. Is it yours? And he'll say that? I've never seen it before. It must be yours, Sasha. And maybe that's true. Maybe someone gave it to me years ago, and I forgot. And did you? Put it back? Cuz asked. I didn't have a chance. He came out of the bathroom. And what about later? After the bath. Or the next time you saw him. After the bath, he put on his pants and left. I haven't talked to him since. There was a pause during which Sasha was keenly aware of Cuz behind her, waiting. She wanted badly to please him, to say something like it was a turning point, everything feels different now, or I called Lizzie and we made up finally, or I've picked up the harp again, or just I'm changing, I'm changing, I'm changing, I've changed. Redemption, transformation, God, how she wanted these things. Every day, every minute. Didn't everyone? Please, she told Cuz. Don't ask me how I feel. All right, he said quietly. They sat in silence, the longest silence that ever had passed between them. Sasha looked at the window pane, rinsed continually with rain, smearing lights in the falling dark. She lay with her body tensed, claiming the couch, her spot in this room, her view of the window and the walls, the faint hum that was always there when she listened, and these minutes of Cuz's time. Another, then another, then one more. Chapter 2. The Gold Cure The shame memories began early that day for Benny, during the morning meeting, while he listened to one of his senior executives make a case for pulling the plug on Stop Slash Go, a sister band Benny had signed to a three-record deal a couple of years back. Then, Stop Slash Go had seemed like an excellent bet. The sisters were young and adorable. Their sound was gritty and simple and catchy, Cindy Lauper meets Chrissy Hind had been Benny's line early on, with a big gulping bass and some fun percussion he recalled a cowbell. Plus they'd written decent songs, hell, they'd sold 12,000 CDs off the stage before Benny ever heard them play. A little time to develop potential singles, some clever marketing, and a decent video could put them over the top. But the sisters were pushing 30, his executive producer, Colette, informed Benny now, and no longer credible as recent high school grads, especially since one of them had a nine-year-old daughter. Their band members were in law school. They'd read two producers, and a third had quit. Still no album. Who's managing them? Benny asked. Their father. I've got their new rough mix, Colette said. The vocals are buried under seven layers of guitar. It was then that the memory overcame Benny. Had the word sisters brought it on? Himself, squatting behind a nunnery in Westchester at sunrise after a night of partying 20 years ago, was it? More? Hearing waves of pure, ringing, spooky sweet sound waft into the paling sky, cloistered nuns who saw no one but one another, who'd taken vows of silence, singing the Massachusetts. Wet grass under his knees, its iridescence pulsing against his exhausted eyeballs. Even now, Benny could hear the unearthly sweetness of those nuns' voices echoing deep in his ears. He'd set up a meeting with their mother superior, the only nun you could talk to brought along a couple of girls from the office for camouflage, and waited in a kind of anteroom until the mother superior appeared behind a square opening in the wall like a window without glass. She wore all white, a cloth tightly encircling her face. Benny remembered her laughing a lot, rosy cheeks lifting into swags, maybe from joy at the thought of bringing God into millions of homes, maybe at the novelty of an A and our guy in purple corduroy making his pitch. The deal was done in a matter of minutes. He'd approached the cutout square to say goodbye, here Benny thrashed in his conference room chair, 
Anticipating the moment it was all leading up to, the mother superior leaned forward slightly, tilting her head in a way that must have triggered something in Benny, because he lurched across the sill and kissed her on the mouth, velvety skin fuzz, an intimate, baby powder smell in the half second before the nun cried out and jerked away. Then pulling back, grinning through his dread, seeing her appalled, injured face. Benny. Colette was standing in front of a console, holding the stop slash go CD. Everyone seemed to be waiting. You want to hear this? But Benny was caught in a loop from 20 years ago, lunging over the sill toward the mother superior like some haywire figure on a clock again. 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 No, he groaned. He turned his sweating face into the rivery breeze that gusted through the windows of the old Tribeca Coffee Factory, where Salzier Records had moved six years ago and now occupied two floors. He'd never recorded the nuns. By the time he'd returned from the convent, a message had been waiting. I don't, he told Colette. I don't want to hear the mix. He felt shaken, soiled. Benny dropped artists all the time, sometimes three in a week, but now his own shame tinged the stop-slash-go sister's failure as if he were to blame. And that feeling was followed by a restless, opposing need to recall what had first excited him about the sisters to feel that excitement again. Why don't I visit them? He said suddenly. Colette looked startled, then suspicious, then worried, a succession that would have amused Benny if he hadn't been so rattled. Really? She asked. Sure. I'll do it today, after I see my kid. Benny's assistant, Sasha, brought him coffee, cream and two sugars. He shimmied a tiny red enameled box from his pocket, popped the tricky latch, pinched a few gold flakes between his trembling fingers, and released them into his cup. He'd begun this regimen two months ago, after reading in a book on Aztec medicine that gold and coffee together were believed to ensure sexual potency. Benny's goal was more basic than potency. Sex drive, his own having mysteriously expired. He wasn't sure quite when or quite why this had happened. The divorce from Stephanie? The battle over Christopher? Having recently turned 44? The tender, circular burns on his left forearm, sustained at the party. A recent debacle engineered by none other than Stephanie's former boss, who is now doing jail time. The gold landed on the coffee's milky surface and spun wildly. Benny was mesmerized by this spinning, which he took as evidence of the explosive gold coffee chemistry, a frenzy of activity that had mostly led him in circles. Wasn't that a fairly accurate description of lust? At times, Benny didn't even mind its disappearance. It was sort of a relief not to be constantly wanting to fuck someone. The world was unquestionably a more peaceful place without the half-hard-on that had been his constant companion since the age of 13, but did Benny want to live in such a world? He sipped his gold-infected coffee and glanced at Sasha's breasts, which had become the litmus test he used to gauge his improvement. He'd lusted after her for most of the years she'd worked for him, first as an intern, then a receptionist, finally his assistant, where she'd remained, oddly reluctant to become an executive in her own right, and she'd somehow managed to elude that lust without ever saying no, or hurting Benny's feelings, or pissing him off. And now, Sasha's breasts in a thin yellow sweater, and Benny felt nothing, not a shiver of harmless excitement. Could he even get it up if he wanted to? Driving to pick up his son, Benny alternated between the Sleepers and the Dead Kennedys, San Francisco bands he'd grown up with, he listened for muddiness, the sense of actual musicians playing actual instruments in an actual room. Nowadays, that quality, if it existed at all, was usually an effect of analog signaling rather than bona de tape. Everything was an effect in the bloodless constructions Benny and his peers were churning out. He worked tirelessly, feverishly, to get things right, stay on top, make songs that people would love and buy and download as ringtones, and steal, of course, above all, to satisfy the multinational crude oil extractors he'd sold his label to five years ago. But Benny knew that what he was bringing into the world was shit. Too clear, too clean. The problem was precision, perfection, 
The problem was digitization, which sucked the life out of everything that got smeared through its microscopic mesh. Film, photography, music, dead. An aesthetic holocaust. Benny knew better than to say this stuff aloud, but the deep thrill of these old songs lay, for Benny, in the rapturous surges of 16-year-old nests they induced. Benny and his high school gang Scotty and Alice, Jocelyn and Rhea, none of whom he'd seen in decades, except for a disturbing encounter with Scotty in his office years ago, yet still half-believed he'd find waiting in line outside the Mabuhay Gardens, long defunct. In San Francisco, green-haired and safety-pinned, if he happened to show up there one Saturday night. And then, as Jello Biafra was thrashing his way through Too Drunk to Fuck, Benny's mind drifted to an awards ceremony a few years ago where he tried to introduce a jazz pianist as incomparable and ended up calling her incompetent before an audience of 2,500. He should never have tried for incomparable wasn't his word too fancy. It stuck in his mouth every time he'd practiced his speech for Stephanie. But it suited the pianist, who had miles of shiny gold hair and had also, she'd let slip, graduated from Harvard. Benny had cherished a rash dream of getting her into bed, feeling that hair sliding over his shoulders and chest. He idled now in front of Christopher's school, waiting for the memory spasm to pass. Driving in, he glimpsed his son crossing the athletic ELD with his friends. Chris had been skipping a little, actually skipping, tossing a ball in the air, but by the time he slumped into Benny's yellow Porsche, any inkling of lightness was gone. Why? Did Chris somehow know about the botched award ceremony? Benny told himself this was nuts, yet was moved by an urge to confess the malapropism to his fourth grader. The will to divulge, doctor. Beat called this impulse, and had exhorted Benny to write down the things he wanted to conda, rather than burden his son with them. Benny did this now, scribbling incompetent on the back of a parking ticket he'd received the day before. Then, recalling the earlier humiliation, he added to the list kissing Mother Superior. So, boss, he said, whatcha feel like doing? Don't know. Any particular wishes? Not really. Benny looked helplessly out the window. A couple of months ago, Chris had asked if they could skip their weekly appointment with Doctor, beat and spend the afternoon doing whatever instead. They hadn't gone back, a decision that Benny now regretted, doing whatever had led to desultory afternoons, often cut short by Chris's announcement that he had homework. How about some coffee? Benny suggested, a spark of smile, can I get a frappuccino? Don't tell your mother. Stephanie didn't approve of Chris drinking coffee reasonable, given that the kid was nine, but Benny couldn't resist the exquisite connection that came of defying his ex-wife in unison. Betrayal bonding, doctor. Beat called this, and like the will to divulge, it was on the list of no-nos. They got their coffees and returned to the Porsche to drink them. Chris sucked greedily at his frappuccino. Benny took out his red enamel box, pinched a few gold flakes, and slipped them under the plastic lid of his cup. What's that? Chris asked. Benny started. The gold was becoming so routine that he'd stop being clandestine about it. Medicine, he said, after a moment. For what? Some symptoms I've been having. Or not having, he added mentally. What symptoms? Was this the frappuccino kicking in? Chris had shifted out of his slump and now sat upright, regarding Benny with his wide, dark, frankly beautiful eyes. Headaches, Benny said. Can I see it? Chris asked. The medicine? In that red thing? Benny handed over the tiny box. Within a couple of seconds, the kid had figured out the tricky latch and popped it open. Whoa, Dad, he said. What is this stuff? I told you. It looks like gold. Flakes of gold. It has a flaky consistency. Can I taste one? So. You don't. Just one. Benny sighed. One. The boy carefully removed a gold flake and placed it on his tongue. What does it taste like? Benny couldn't help asking. He'd only consumed the gold in his coffee, 
where it had no discernible flavor. Like metal, Chris said. It's awesome. Can I have another one? Benny started the car. Was there something obviously sham about the medicine story? Clearly the kid wasn't buying it. One more, he said. And that's it. His son took a fat pinch of gold flakes and put them on his tongue. Benny tried not to think of the money. The truth was he'd spent $8,000 on gold in the past two months. A coke habit would have cost him less. Chris sucked on the gold and closed his eyes. Dad, he said. It's like waking me up from the inside. Interesting, Benny mused. That's exactly what it's supposed to do. Is it working? Sounds like it is. But on you, Chris said. Benny was fairly certain his son had asked him more questions in the past ten minutes than in the prior year and a half since he and Stephanie had split. Could this be a side effect of the gold? Curiosity? I've still got the headaches, he said. He was driving aimlessly among the Crandale mansions, doing whatever involved a lot of aimless driving, every one of which seemed to have four or five blonde children in Ralph Lauren playing out front. Seeing these kids, it was clearer than ever to Benny that he hadn't had a chance of lasting in this place, swarthy and unkempt looking as he was even when freshly showered and shaved. Stephanie, meanwhile, had ascended to the club's number one doubles team. Chris, Benny said, there's a musical group I need to visit a pair of young sisters. Well, youngish sisters. I was planning to go later on, but if you're interested, we could. Sure. Really? Yeah. Did sure and yeah mean that Chris was giving in to please Benny as doctor? Beat had noted he often did. Or had the golden-sided curiosity extended to a new interest in Benny's work? Chris had grown up around rock groups, of course, but he was part of the post-piracy generation, for whom things like copyright and creative ownership didn't exist. Benny didn't blame Chris, of course, the dismantlers who had murdered the music business were a generation beyond his son, adults now. Still, he'd heeded Dr. Beat's advice to stop hectoring, Beat's word, Chris about the industry's decline and focus instead on enjoying music they both liked Pearl Jam, for example, which Benny blasted all the way to Mount Vernon. The stop-slash-go sisters still lived with their parents in a sprawling, run-down house under bushy suburban trees. Benny had been here two or three years ago when he'd first discovered them, before he'd entrusted the sisters to the first in a series of executives who had failed to accomplish a blessed thing. As he and Chris left the car, the memory of his last visit provoked a convulsion of anger in Benny that made heat roll up toward his head why the fuck hadn't anything happened in all this time. He found Sasha waiting at the door. She'd caught the train at Grand Central after Benny called and had somehow beaten him here. Hiya, Crisco, Sasha said, musing his son's hair. She had known Chris all his life. She'd run out to Dwayne Reed to buy him pacifiers and diapers. Benny glanced at her breasts. Nothing. Or nothing sexual. He did feel a swell of gratitude and appreciation for his assistant, as opposed to the murderous rage he felt toward the rest of his staff. There was a pause. Yellow light scissored through the leaves. Benny lifted his gaze from Sasha's breasts to her face. She had high cheekbones and narrow green eyes, wavy hair that ranged from reddish to purplish, depending on the month. Today it was red. She was smiling at Chris, but Benny detected worry somewhere in the smile. He rarely thought of Sasha as an independent person, and beyond a vague awareness of boyfriends coming and going, vague first out of respect for her privacy, lately out of indifference, he knew few specifics of her life. But seeing her outside this family home, Benny experienced awe of curiosity. Sasha had still been at NYU when he'd first met her at a conduit's gig at the Pyramid Club that put her in her thirties now. Why hadn't she married? Did she want kids? She seemed suddenly older, or was it just that Benny seldom looked directly at her face? What? She said, feeling his stare. Nothing. You okay? Better than okay, Benny said and gave the door a sharp knock. 
The sisters looked fantastic if not right out of high school, then at least right out of college, especially if they'd taken a year or two O or maybe transferred a couple of times. They wore their dark hair pulled back from their faces, and their eyes were glittering, and they had a whole fucking book full of new material look at this. Benny's fury at his team intensified, but it was pleasurable, motivating fury. The sisters' nervous excitement jittered up the house. They knew his visit was their last, best hope. Chandra was the older one, Louisa the younger. Louisa's daughter, Olivia, had been riding a trike in the driveway on Benny's last visit, but now she wore skin-tight jeans and a jeweled tiara that seemed to be a fashion choice, not a costume. Benny felt Chris snap to attention when Olivia entered the room, as if a charmed snake had risen from its basket inside him. They went single file down a narrow flight of stairs to the sisters' basement recording studio. Their father had built it for them years ago. It was tiny, with orange shag covering the floor, ceiling, and walls. Benny took the only seat, noting with approval a cowbell by the keyboard. Coffee. Sasha asked him. Chandra led her upstairs to make it. Louisa sat at the keyboard, teasing out melodies. Olivia took up a set of bongo drums and began loosely accompanying her mother. She handed Chris a tambourine, and to Benny's astonishment, his son settled in beating the thing in perfect time. Nice, he thought. Very nice. The day had swerved unexpectedly into good. The almost teenage daughter wasn't a problem. He decided she could join the group as a younger sister or a cousin, strengthen the tween angle. Maybe Chris could be part of it, too, although he and Olivia would have to switch instruments. A boy on a tambourine. Sasha brought his coffee, and Benny took out his red enamel box and dropped in a pinch of flakes. As he sipped, a sensation of pleasure filled his whole torso the way a snowfall fills up a sky. Jesus, he felt good. He'd been delegating too much. Hearing the music get made, that was the thing— people and instruments and beaten-looking equipment aligning abruptly into a single structure of sound, flexible and alive. The sisters were at the keyboard arranging their music, and Benny experienced a bump of anticipation. Something was going to happen here. He knew it, felt it pricking his arms and chest. You've got pro tools on there, right? He asked, indicating the laptop on a table amid the instruments. Is everything mic'd? Can we lay down some tracks right now? The sisters nodded and checked the laptop. They were ready to record. Vocals, too. Chandra asked. Absolutely, Benny said. Let's do it all at once. Let's blow the roof o' oh, your fucking house. Sasha was standing to Benny's right. So many bodies had heated up the little room, lifting o' oh, her skin a perfume she'd been wearing for years, or was it a lotion? That smelled like apricots. Not just the sweet part, but that slight bitterness around the pit. And as Benny breathed in Sasha's lotion smell, his prick roused itself suddenly like an old hound getting a swift kick. He almost jumped out of his seat in startled amazement, but he kept his cool. Don't push things. Just let it happen. Don't scare it away. Then the sisters began to sing. Oh, the raw almost threadbare sound of their voices mixed with the clash of instruments these sensations met with a faculty deeper in Benny than judgment or even pleasure. They communed directly with his body, whose shivering, bursting reply made him dizzy. And here was his first erection in months prompted by Sasha, who had been too near Benny all these years for him to really see her, like in those 19th century novels he'd read in secret because only girls were supposed to like them. He seized the cowbell and stick and began whacking at it with zealous blows. He felt the music in his mouth, his ears, his ribs, or was that his own pulse? He was on re, and from this zenith of lusty, devouring joy, he recalled opening an email he'd been inadvertently copied on between two colleagues and finding himself referred to as a hairball. God. What a feeling of liquid shame had pooled in Benny when he'd read that word. He hadn't been sure what it meant, that he was hairy, true, unclean, false. Or was it literal as in, he clogged people's throats and made them gag, the way Stephanie's cat, Sylph, 
occasionally vomited hair onto the carpet. Benny had gone for a haircut that very day and seriously considered having his back and upper arms waxed until Stephanie talked him out of it, running her cool hands over his shoulders that night in bed, telling him she loved him hairy that the last thing the world needed was another waxed guy. Music. Benny was listening to music. The sisters were screaming, the tiny room imploding from their sound, and Benny tried to ND again the deep contentment he'd felt just a minute ago. But hairball had unsettled him. The room felt uncomfortably small. Benny set down his cowbell and slipped the parking ticket from his pocket. He scribbled hairball in hopes of exorcising the memory. He took a slow inhale and rested his eyes on Chris who was ailing the tambourine trying to match the sister's erratic tempo, and right away it happened again, taking his son for a haircut a couple of years ago, having his longtime barber, Stu, put down his scissors and pull Benny aside. There's a problem with your son's hair, he'd said. A problem. Stu walked Benny over to Chris in the chair and parted his hair to reveal some tan little creatures the size of poppy seeds moving around on his scalp. Benny felt himself grow faint. Lice, the barber whispered. They get it at school. But he goes to private school. Benny had blurted. In Crandale, New York. Chris's eyes had gone wide with fear. What is it, Daddy? Other people were staring, and Benny had felt responsible, with his own riotous head of hair, to the point where he sprayed off. In his armpits every morning to this day, and kept an extra can at the office crazy. He knew it. Getting their coats while everyone watched, Benny with a burning face, God, it hurt him to think of this now hurt him physically, as if the memory were raking over him and leaving gashes. He hid his face in his hands. He wanted to cover his ears, block out the cacophony of stop slash go, but he concentrated on Sasha just to his right, her sweet bitter smell, and found himself remembering a girl he'd chased at a party when he first came to New York and was selling vinyl on the Lower East Side a hundred years ago, some delicious blonde, Abby, was it? In the course of keeping tabs on Abby, Benny had done several lines of coke and been stricken with a severe instantaneous need to empty his bowels. He'd been relieving himself on the can in what must have been, although Benny's brain ached to recall this, a miasma of annihilating stink, when the unlockable bathroom door had jumped open and there was Abby, staring down at him. There'd been a horrible, bottomless instant when their eyes met, then she'd shut the door. Benny had left the party with someone else, there was always someone else and their night of fun, which he felt comfortable presuming, had erased the confrontation with Abby. But now it was back oh, it was back, bringing waves of shame so immense they seemed to engulf whole parts of Benny's life and drag them away, achievements, successes, moments of pride, all of it raised to the point where there was nothing he was nothing a guy on a john looking up at the nauseated face of a woman he'd wanted to impress. Benny leaped from his stool, squashing the cowbell under one foot. Sweat stung his eyes. His hair engaged palpably with the ceiling shag. You okay? Sasha asked, alarmed. I'm sorry, Benny panted, mopping his brow. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Back upstairs, he stood outside the front door, pulling fresh air into his lungs. The stop slash go sisters and daughter clustered around him, apologizing for the airlessness of the recording studio their father's ongoing failure to vent it properly, reminding one another in spirited tones of the many times they themselves had grown faint, trying to work there. We can hum the tunes, they said, and they did, in harmony, Olivia too, all of them standing not far from Benny's face, desperation quivering their smiles. A gray cat made a figure eight around Benny's shins, nudging him rapturously with its bony head. It was a relief to get back in the car. He was driving Sasha to the city, but he had to get Chris home first. His son hunched in the back seat, facing the open window. It seemed to Benny that his lark of an idea for the afternoon had gone awry. He fended off the longing to look at Sasha's breasts, waiting to calm down, 
regain his equilibrium before putting himself to the test. Finally, at a red light, he glanced slowly, casually in her direction, not even focusing at first, then peering intently. Nothing. He was clobbered by loss so severe that it took physical E or not to howl. He'd had it. He'd had it. But where had it gone? Dad, green light, Chris said. Driving again, Benny forced himself to ask his son, So, boss, what did you think? The kid didn't answer. Maybe he was pretending not to hear, or maybe the wind was too loud in his face. Benny glanced at Sasha. What about you? Oh, she said, they're awful. Benny blinked, stung. He felt a gust of anger at Sasha that passed a few seconds later, leaving odd relief. Of course, they were awful. That was the problem. Unlistenable, Sasha went on. No wonder you were having a heart attack. I don't get it, Benny said. What? Two years ago, they sounded different. Sasha gave him a quizzical look. It wasn't two years, she said. It was V.E. Why so sure? Because last time, I came to their house after a meeting at Windows on the World. It took Benny a minute to comprehend this. Oh, he finally said. How close to? Four days. Wow. I never knew that. He waited out a respectful pause, then continued. Still, two years, five years. Sasha turned and stared at him. She looked angry. Who am I talking to? She asked. You're Benny Salazar. This is the music business. Five years is five hundred years your words. Benny didn't answer. They were approaching his former house, as he thought of it. He couldn't say old house, but he also couldn't say house anymore, although he'd certainly paid for it. His former house was withdrawn from the street on a grassy slope, a gleaming white colonial that had filled him with awe every time he'd taken a key from his pocket to open the front door. Benny stopped at the curb and killed the engine. He couldn't bring himself to drive up the driveway. Chris was leaning forward from the back seat, his head between Benny and Sasha. Benny wasn't sure how long he'd been there. I think you need some of your medicine, Dad, he said. Good idea, Benny said. He began tapping his pockets, but the little red box was nowhere to be found. Here, I've got it, Sasha said. You dropped it coming out of the recording room. She was doing that more and more, finding things he'd misplaced sometimes before Benny even knew they were missing. It added to the almost trance-like dependence he felt on her. Thanks, Sash, he said. He opened the box. God, the flakes were shiny. Gold didn't tarnish, that was the thing. The flakes would look the same in five years as they did right now. Should I put some on my tongue, like you did? He asked his son. Yeah, but I get some too. Sasha, you want to try a little medicine? Benny asked. Um, okay, she said. What's it supposed to do? Solve your problems, Benny said. I mean, headaches. Not that you have any. Never, Sasha said with that same wary smile. They each took a pinch of gold flakes and placed them on their tongues. Benny tried not to calculate the dollar value of what was inside their mouths. He concentrated on the taste. Was it metallic, or was that just his expectation? Coffee, or was that what was left in his mouth? He tongued the gold in a tight knot and sucked the juice from within it. Sour, he thought. Bitter. Sweet. Each one seemed true for a second, but in the end Benny had an impression of something mineral, like stone, even earth. And then the lump melted away. I should go, Dad, Chris said. Benny let him out of the car and hugged him hard. As always, Chris went still in his embrace, but whether he was savoring it or enduring it, Benny could never tell. He drew back and looked at his son. The baby he and Stephanie had nuzzled and kissed, now this painful, mysterious presence. Benny was tempted to say, don't tell your mother about the medicine, craving an instant of connection with Chris before he went inside. But he hesitated, employing a mental calculation doctor. Beat had taught him. Did he really think the kid would tell Stephanie about the gold? 
No. And that was his alert. Betrayal bonding. Benny said nothing. He got back in the car, but didn't turn the key. He was watching Chris scale the undulating lawn toward his former house. The grass was fluorescently bright. His son seemed to buckle under his enormous backpack. What the hell was in it? Benny had seen professional photographers carry less. As Chris neared the house, he blurred a little, or maybe it was Benny's eyes watering. He found it excruciating, watching his son's long journey to the front door. He worried Sasha would speak say something like he's a great kid, or that was fun something that would require Benny to turn and look at her. But Sasha knew better. She knew everything. She sat with Benny in silence, watching Chris climb the fat, bright grass to the front door, then open it without turning and go inside. They didn't speak again until they'd passed from the Henry Hudson Parkway onto the West Side Highway, heading into Lower Manhattan. Benny played some early Who, the Stooges, bands he'd listened to before he was even old enough to go to a concert. Then he got into Flipper, the Mutants, Eye Protection 70s Bay Area groups he and his gang had slam danced to at the Mabuhe Gardens when they weren't practicing with their own unlistenable band, the Flaming Dildos. He sensed Sasha paying attention and toyed with the idea that he was confessing to her his disillusionment, his hatred for the industry he'd given his life to. He began weighing each musical choice, drawing out his argument through the songs themselves Patti Smith's ragged poetry. But why did she quit? The jock hardcore of Black Flag and the Circle Jerks giving way to alternative, that great compromise, down, down, down to the singles he'd just today been petitioning radio stations to add, husks of music, lifeless and cold as the squares of OC neon cutting the blue twilight. It's incredible, Sasha said, how there's just nothing there. Astounded, Benny turned to her. Was it possible that she'd followed his musical rant to its grim conclusion? Sasha was looking downtown, and he followed her eyes to the empty space where the Twin Towers had been. There should be something, you know, she said, not looking at Benny. Like an echo, or an outline. Benny sighed. They'll put something up, he said. When they were finally done squabbling, I know. But she kept looking south, as if it were a problem her mind couldn't solve. Benny was relieved she hadn't understood. He remembered his mentor, Lou Klein, telling him in the 90s that rock and roll had peaked at Monterey Pop. They'd been in Lou's house in L.A. with its waterfalls, the pretty girls Lou always had, his car collection out front, and Benny had looked into his idol's famous face and thought, you're finished. Nostalgia was the end, everyone knew that. Lou had died three months ago, after being paralyzed from a stroke. At a stoplight, Benny remembered his list. He took out the parking ticket and finished it off. What do you keep scribbling on that ticket? Sasha asked. Benny handed it to her, his reluctance to have the list seen by human eyes overwhelming him a half second late. To his horror, she began reading it aloud, Kissing Mother Superior, Incompetent, Hairball, Poppy Seeds, Auntie Can. Benny listened in agony, as if the words themselves might provoke a catastrophe. But they were neutralized the instant Sasha spoke them in her scratchy voice. Not bad, she said. They're titles, right? Sure, Benny said. Can you read them one more time? She did, and now they sounded like titles to him, too. He felt peaceful, cleansed. Kissing Mother Superior is my favorite, Sasha said. We've gotta find a way to use that one. They'd pulled up outside her building on Forsyth. The street felt desolate and underlit. Benny wished she could live in a better place. Sasha gathered up her ubiquitous black bag, a shapeless wishing well from which she'd managed to rest whatever loo or number or slip of paper he'd needed for the past twelve years. Benny seized her thin white hand. Listen, he said. Listen, Sasha. She looked up. Benny felt no lust at all. He wasn't even hard. What he felt for Sasha was love, a safety and closeness like what he'd had with Stephanie before he'd let her down so many times that she couldn't stop being mad. I'm crazy for you, Sasha, he said. Crazy. Come on, Benny, Sasha chided lightly. None of that. 
He held her hand between both of his. Sasha's fingers were trembly and cold. Her other hand was on the door. Wait, Benny said. Please. She turned to him, somber now. There's no way, Benny, she said. We need each other. They looked at one another in the failing light. The delicate bones of Sasha's face were lightly freckled it was a girl's face, but she'd stop being a girl when he wasn't watching. Sasha leaned over and kissed Benny's cheek. A chaste kiss. A kiss between brother and sister, mother and son. But Benny felt the softness of her skin, the warm movement of her breath. Then she was out of the car. She waved to him through the window and said something he didn't catch. Benny lunged across the empty seat, his face near the glass, staring fixedly as she said it again. Still, he missed it. As he struggled to open the door, Sasha said it once more, mouthing the words extra slowly, See. You. Tomorrow.